Hello and welcome to EWTM Pro-Life Weekly, your weekly dose of the top pro-life news and issues, all from a Catholic perspective. I'm Catherine Hadro in our Washington, D.C. studio. Thanks for joining us. In this week's show, Pope Francis strongly condemns abortion, comparing it to Nazi crimes. Argentina passes an abortion bill coming closer to legalizing elective abortion in the predominantly Catholic nation. And this. This church that throughout all of its history has been consistent on its teachings and its practices supporting the sanctity of human life. The founder of 40 Days for Life comes home to the Catholic Church and credits in part the pro-life movement. But first we start off this week's show with a look at an important election in Alabama. U.S. Representative Martha Roby has been forced into a July runoff for the Republican nomination for her seat. She will face off against Bobby Bright for Alabama's second congressional district. Bright is a former Montgomery mayor and former Democrat who claims to be pro-life. Roby, during her time on Capitol Hill since 2011, has co-sponsored a number of pieces of pro-life legislation. Representative Martha Roby of Alabama joins us here in studio along with Marjorie Dannenfelser, president of the Susan B. Anthony List. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Yeah, this thank is going to be a great discussion. Congresswoman, I want to just delve right into your pro-life record. You were the first one to speak out on the House floor when those undercover Planned Parenthood videos from the Center for Medical Progress were first being released. Let's take a look back at part of that speech. To those who, who haven't seen the video, I urge you uh, and encourage you to watch it, but you need to be forewarned. Um, the casual and callous way that she details how babies can be killed in such a way that their tiny hearts, lungs, and livers can be taken and sold for profit is simply horrifying. To quote Dr. Nukatola, we have been very good at getting heart, lung, and liver. So I'm not going to crush that part. I'm going to basically crush below. I'm going to crush above, and I'm going to see if I can get it all intact been nearly three years already, but Congresswoman, what was it like to give that impassioned speech? Well, I mean, just even to hear those words now are very emotional. Um, I remember I was sitting in a appropriations markup, committee mark that morning, and was scrolling through Twitter on my phone and came across the article and just couldn't believe what I was reading. And so I immediately text a link to my staff and said, is this real? Is this really happening? Um, so as soon as the committee mark was over, I immediately went to the floor to give that one minute speech. And as I referenced uh, in that speech, one minute wasn't nearly long enough, but it did give me an opportunity. And I remember very distinctly, there were other members waiting in line to, to give their one minutes and they too were filled with emotion at hearing this for the first time. Um, so look, any opportunity to fight for the unborn, um, as you know, I'm unapologetically uh, pro-life and consider it uh, a, an amazing privilege to be able to be a voice in Congress for those that have no voice. But listening to those words, and I think what was so emotional about it is that I hadn't actually read the speech mm -hmm. that the comments that my staff had per helped prepare me for. But when those words came out of my mouth about crushing mm -hmm. babies, I just was overwhelmed with emotion because of, of what it is. And, um, and so uh, I was privileged to have that opportunity that day, but knew that that was just the beginning of a long road ahead to expose what had been done, but to use my seat in Congress to ensure that this, these practices uh, would stop. And since then, you have continued to be very outspoken on your pro-life views. Congresswoman, what are some policies that are close to your heart, ones that you think really need to be prioritized? Well, there's many. Mm -hmm. And again, I think our, our greatest frustration in the House of Representatives is that we've gotten a lot of these measures across the finish line in the House only to be stalled in the Senate. And the one that I've so enjoyed working with uh, Marjorie and Susan B. Anthony List um, 
on is the pain capable bill. Mm -hmm. And I, I'll just tell you, like sitting there on the house floor, listening to the, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle calling us extreme uh, for taking a position that abortions should not be performed after six months of pregnancy when we know there is uh, medical evidence that babies feel um, pain. I, I take the position that it's extreme to not at least be willing to do that. Does it go far enough? Absolutely not. Uh, but is it a step uh, in the right direction? Of course. And as we saw, the pain-capable bill passed in the House um, only to fail in the Senate. And that continues to be a theme with these measures where we've tried to uh, codify the Hyde Amendment and other measures that we've taken to prohibit uh, Planned Parenthood dollar, dollars going to Planned Parenthood um, and other abortion providers, um, our greatest frustration is that we just don't have enough votes. When we have a president, uh, mm -hmm. after eight years mm -hmm. of the Obama administration mm -hmm. fighting the pro-life movement every step of the way, we now have a president who is willing to sign these pro-life measures into law, and yet we just can't get the Senate to pass. And that's really where I think all of our frustration uh, uh, is. Yeah, I think so. And Congressman, you are now facing an important runoff election next month in your home state of Alabama. You're running against a former Democrat. Can you tell us more about the specifics of this race? What should our viewers know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, of course, we were grateful for all of the support that uh, I received during the primary. And I'm just so thankful for my husband and my children and all all of Team Roby, everybody who signed up to get out the vote, uh, and we were able to be successful in the primary. But as you know, Alabama is a runoff state, so if you don't get above that 50 percent threshold, you're you're pushed into a six-week mm -hmm. uh, runoff. So here we are, and um, you hit the nail on the head. Um, the gentleman that is my opponent, Bobby Bright, um, he uh, was a Democrat. Uh, that was elected in 2008, and his very first vote in Congress was voting for Nancy Pelosi as mm -hmm. Speaker. And we all know all of the harmful policies that have come, uh, that w many Alabamians and Americans are still suffering under that came out of those two years between 2008 and 2010. And so I think it's really important that the voters in Alabama know uh, that I am a conservative Republican with a record that I'm proud of, that I believe reflects the conservative values and principles of the people I represent in Alabama's 2nd District. And that really is the distinction. He is a Democrat who supported Nancy Pelosi and Barack Obama, and I'm a conservative Republican. Marjorie, your group, the Susan B. Anthony List, has endorsed Representative Roby for this race. Sure As a pro-life leader, why is this race so important? Well, I think everything that Martha just said in her impassioned plea on the floor of the House to protect these children says everything that we need to say. Martha is front and center the poster child for the Susan B. Anthony list and what we look for in a candidate. Certainly the intellectual uh, arguments are vital and our legal background helps with all that, mm -hmm. but what you just saw on that clip can't be replaced. That passion, that heart, that love of life, especially being a mother, nothing is better than that. So we're putting all we can into making sure that Martha wins, that she comes back, that we're, you know, we're going to increase our numbers in the Senate so that we can do a better job in getting those bills passed over there. But we really need you and we love you and we're praying for you. Mm, I appreciate that very much. And Marjorie, the Congresswoman did mention the Unborn Child Protection Act. Mm -hmm. What has her role been in fighting to pass this piece of important legislation? Well, I mean, again, it's been as a as a beautiful spokeswoman for this cause, right in the midst of battle, where on the other side is a Nancy Pelosi who wants to have it both ways, wants to be protecting that pro-abortion policy plank at abortion at any time in the Democratic Party, and she wants to be able to um, pretend like it doesn't exist when it comes to places of Alabama, like Alabama. That simply cannot be. Until the Democratic Party actually changes that plank, we simply can't have people who are who are falling in line behind that agenda and we need you so come thank on back you. thank you I know this is a race that we will continue to monitor closely thank you both for being here congresswoman Martha Roby and Marjorie Dana Felser thank you thanks
President Donald Trump has recently issued the new Protect Life rule, which stops Title X family planning dollars from going to abortion groups like Planned Parenthood. Once this rule goes into effect, Planned Parenthood will lose up to 60 million of our tax dollars each year. It's their second largest source of tax funding. But here's the deal. Before the Protect Life rule can go into effect, it must undergo a 60-day public comment period. That's where you come in. Listen up for this week's very important call to action. We need you pro-lifers to voice your support for the Protect Life rule. Here's how you can do that. Open up your internet browser and type in ProLifeWeekly.com. At this website, you can flood the Department of Health and Human Services with comments to support President Trump's life-saving new regulation. We've made it easy for you and have already drafted a comment for you to submit. But you can, of course, add your own thoughts and make the comment your own. Once you get to ProLifeWeekly.com, simply enter in your personal information. You'll then be brought to the prepared comment and you'll just have to click Submit. Your message will go straight to the HHS department. Let's make our pro-life voice heard now during this comment period. Be sure to submit your comment in support of President Trump's Protect Life rule by going to ProLifeWeekly.com. We go now to pro-life headlines from around the globe. Ireland's Prime Minister announces publicly funded hospitals in Ireland will be required to perform abortions even if they are Catholic and morally opposed to it. Prime Minister Leo Varadkar clarified to the Irish Parliament that individual medical professionals can opt out of performing abortions, but entire hospitals will not be able to now that the nation has voted to take away protections for the unborn. Pope Francis condemns abortion, comparing getting an abortion after a prenatal test result to Nazism. In off-the-cuff remarks to an Italian family association, the Holy Father said, Last century, the whole world was scandalized by what the Nazis did to purify the race. Today, we do the same thing, but with white gloves. Pope Francis urged families to accept children as God gives them to us. And in Pope Francis's homeland, Argentina's lower house of Congress approves a bill to legalize elective abortion in the first 14 weeks of pregnancy. The vote was tight 129 to 125. Argentina's president, Mauricio Macri, says he will sign the bill if it gets to his desk, even though he says he opposes abortion. We'll continue to track this abortion bill in Argentina for you and now turn to our next guest for further analysis. Alejandra Bermudez is the director of Asi Prensa, the world's largest Catholic news agency in Spanish. He's also the executive director of Catholic News Agency. Alejandra joins us from Denver, Colorado. Thank you for your time today. Great to be with you. First off, Alejandro, can you put this into perspective for us? How significant is it that Argentina, a predominantly Catholic nation, is in the process of legalizing abortion? In, in, Catherine, the, uh, the abortion lobby, uh, mostly financed by abortionists in the United States, are uh, an incredibly war machine that has been working on this for 40 years. And uh, they have avoided systematically making this an issue for a referendum. What they have tried to do is influence either Supreme Courts around Latin America, or in this case, like in Argentina, influence Congress. We are basically one step away from the Senate to decide on this, and it would be simply cataclysmic for Latin America. Is that what happened here then? The abortion lobby pressured the abortion debate in Argentina? I mean, the nation has opposed abortion for so long. Yes. Uh, this is unfortunately something that we have inherited from the Obama era. As you remember, the, uh, every Democratic administration it suspends the Mexico City policy, mm -hmm. which forces the United States not to uh, uh, promote or support any law that would legalize abortion in those countries 
in which abortion is illegal. So we're basically having a tons of dollars, I mean, literally millions of dollars during the eight years of the past administration that has been pushing these and making a very powerful lobby. And if you consider, unfortunately, how corrupt uh, Argentinian politics is, you have many people not only voting against, against uh, I mean, congressmen, not only voting against their own consciences, but of course against the vast majority of the uh, the, the the Argentinian people. I mean, the I have seen uh, marches, pro-life marches in protest to defend the right to life in Argentina that I haven't seen in my 30 years as a Catholic journalist in Latin America. Wow. And Argentina, Alejandro, is Pope Francis's homeland. Has the Holy Father spoken out against this? And what are the Argentinian bishops saying? Well, number one, uh, the Pope issued this past weekend one of the strongest uh, uh, pro-life messages in which he, he, rightly, he rightly compared uh, uh, the, the uh, elimination of, of uh, babies in the mother's womb as a Nazi policy and said that the only difference between Nazis and current abortionists is that they use white gloves. The Argentinian bishops have been very specifically militant in supporting the right to life, addressing the Argentinian people to put uh, pressure on their representatives. They have issued a statement to President uh, Mauricio Macri uh, asking him to intervene with his political party and oppose this. They have addressed congressmen and senators, so they have been extremely active as a body, the Argentina bishops, mm -hmm. and also individually. What should we know about Argentina's President Mauricio Macri? He's Catholic, but he says he will not veto this pro-abortion bill, even though he opposes abortion. Uh, Mauricio Macri has always proclaimed himself at, as a Catholic, but this is not a strange thing in Latin America mm. with many of the anti-life mm. uh, uh, politicians. I don't know Mr. Macri's conscience, so I don't know if he's genuinely pro-life or, or anti-life, but I do know that as the major of Buenos Aires, which is a city that concentrates one-fourth of the Argentinian population, uh, that he, he's the one that legalized uh, gay marriage in, in, mm. in Buenos Aires. Mm. So uh, I don't think uh, uh, Mauricio Macri has ever been solidly on the side of life. Finally, Alejandro, you report on news from all around the globe. We recently saw Ireland's vote to take away protection from the unborn. Now we see Argentina's abortion vote. As a Catholic journalist, how do you view and think about these updates that can be so disheartening? It's, it's a very dramatic situation, very dramatic situation. I will still uh, 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 underscore a little difference between Ireland and, and Argentina is that in Ireland we had a referendum and we have a culture that is really going away from Catholicism. Mm -hmm. It's not exactly the case in Argentina. The vast majority of the people who post abortion, just to put you an example, there is one whole province in the Argentina has a federal system, so a province would equate to a state. There is mm. one whole province that today announced that as a province, all the hospitals will claim the right to freedom of conscience and will open post-abortion. Nevertheless, I do see that we're going into this process that Pope Benedict XVI somehow predicted we were going to happen. At one point, we Catholics are going to be a minority, and it, it will be upon us to be what he calls a creative minority, mm. meaning ones that will have the energy, the conviction that the first 12 apostles have confront a completely pagan culture successfully. Wow, that is a powerful reminder of Pope Benedict's words. Thank you so much. Alejandro Bermudez, director of Asi Prensa. Thank you. When we come back, 
All this has done has bolstered my pro-life convictions and my convictions to do everything I can to spread the good news that I have been blessed to receive. The founder of 40 Days for Life shares his recent Catholic conversion story and how it strengthened his pro-life work. Stay tuned as EWTM Pro-Life Weekly continues after this break. Welcome back to EWTM Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Hadro. Is a California science teacher in trouble for teaching the truth about abortion? That's this week's Speak Out segment. The Sacramento Bee is reporting that the Sacramento City Unified School District has launched an investigation after a middle school science teacher showed her students videos about abortion procedures during a sex education class. The videos created by Live Action feature former abortionist Dr. Anthony Leventino discussing how abortion procedures are performed during various stages. Live Action says the videos were created in consultation with a group of doctors and experts. Leventino himself has performed more than 1,200 abortions. But the spokesperson for the school district called the videos, quote, completely inappropriate. And one parent reportedly said they were biased, misleading, and graphic. Live Action was quick to respond. Here's part of the statement from Live Action President Lila Rose. California allows abortion clinics to perform an abortion on a teen girl without her parents' knowledge or consent, making it absolutely necessary that schools educate students about the facts of abortion. And that's what these videos are, fact-based. It's one thing if this science teacher is facing potential punishment for not following school protocol and notifying parents, for example. But the school district spokesperson called the videos, quote, completely inappropriate. And that's what I can't square away. Why inappropriate? These videos feature a former abortionist explaining clearly, not exaggerating, what an abortion entails step by step. It's accurate. One parent reportedly called them graphic, but in watching them, they are age appropriate, especially compared to actual photos of an abortion. They instead feature medical animations. But yes, abortion itself is graphic. It's gruesome. It's the killing of an innocent child, and there's no way you can teach abortion without mentioning that scientific reality. So are we going to equip our students with the truth, or will school districts not teach facts about abortion? all while Planned Parenthood is free to run rampant with their propaganda in classrooms across the nation. We need to make sure we all monitor this in our local schools and always speak out. And remember, there is something you can do at home right now to counter today's culture of death, and that's by following our call to action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com to submit your comment to the Department of Health and Human Services to show your support for the Protect Life rule. He started one of the most flourishing pro-life groups, and now he's starting his journey as a Catholic. Here's the powerful story behind how pro-life leader David B. Wright recently came home to Rome. I think that David is just an incredible witness. He is truly a holy man. Margaret B. Wright might just be a modern-day Saint Monica. After 28 years of faithful prayer, her husband, David, entered the Catholic Church this past Easter Vigil. And everything about this Easter Vigil could not have been more perfect. I cannot, ex I can't describe the joy. <laughs> I've never felt that kind of joy in my whole life. It was perfect. <laughs> the pro-life movement better knows David B. Wright as the founder and former CEO of 40 Days for Life, the global prayer and fasting campaign outside of abortion facilities. Coming into communion with the Catholic Church was something this former Presbyterian discerned for years. There were three things that really led to my ultimately feeling led to enter into the Catholic Church. Number one was hearing God calling me consistently, particularly through an hour of adoration. Uh, the second thing was the faithful witness that my Catholic wife and Catholic children lived out right before my eyes, which attracted me. And third was getting to work alongside so many Catholic Christians who make up the pro-life movement and watching their witness and their example. And I wanted what they had. 
While still discerning, B. Wright would sometimes jump on the phone with well-known theologian and Catholic convert Scott Hahn as he grappled with questions about the faith. B. Wright would also attend Mass every Sunday with his family and regularly go to adoration, which is where, at his home parish in Fredericksburg, Virginia, he decided to take the leap. His not being Catholic was a surprise to me. When I arrived here, uh, it took me several months to learn that he wasn't Catholic uh, because he was so faithful and he was there. And eventually I noticed, I said, wait a minute, there's one thing missing and that's communion. With his wife as his sponsor and St. John Paul II as his confirmation saint, David was received into the Catholic Church this past Easter vigil at St. Mary of the Immaculate Conception. The church's pastor, Father John Moseman, sees B. Wright's journey as part of a tapestry of grace with all the threads of his life coming together. When we're all together in the Lord and rejoicing, we're going to see how his work in the pro-life ministry, how his interactions with regular everyday Catholics and everyone throughout the world have been an instrument of grace in bringing him home to full union. The 40 Days for Life founder cites the church's teaching on life for helping him cross the Tiber. This church that throughout all of its history has been consistent on its teachings and its practices supporting the sanctity of human life. The faith tradition that I was raised in, unfortunately that denominational body has taken positions that are not supportive of human life. And that started to cause me to question and ask why? Why is this happening when it's such a clear message in the gospel and in scripture? David B. Ray is in fact one of many pro-life leaders who has converted to Catholicism. Marjorie Dannenfelser, president of the pro-life Susan B. Anthony List, is also a convert and a friend of David's. His recent yes to the church still stirs up strong emotions as she recalls that day. I called him and said, oh my gosh, I'm so happy. <laughs> Such great news. And he, and he was happy too. And he said, Margaret, she's here. You know, she's St. Margaret. She's standing right next to me. Every time we go up as a family to receive communion, I feel like I'm sort of having an out-of-body experience. Like I'm looking down myself going, is this really happening? For 28 years, this didn't happen. Is this really occurring? This is so cool. <laughs> a gift to his family. David B. Wright says his conversion is also a gift to his life-affirming work. There are so many additional graces that I did not previously have. Uh, the grace is coming from the sacrament of reconciliation, the grace is coming from communion, the grace is coming from the sacrament of confirmation. And so all of that has given me a greater peace, a greater conviction, and greater courage to take this pro-life movement and to take this beautiful faith that we have and share it as far and as wide as I possibly can. David B. Wright's faith witness is a testimony to the witnesses surrounding him, from the church and her stance on life to the faithful, loving, and patient witness from his family. That's it for this edition of EWTM Pro-Life Weekly. Thanks for being with us. Until next time, you can reach us with questions, ideas, or comments by emailing prolifeweekly at EWTN.com. I look forward to seeing you here again next week. Remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.